world. What does covetousness and grief for the world mean? I want it. I don't want it. That's basically what it's talking about here. You're letting go of that mind that gets caught up in the story about liking and disliking this or that. It's getting caught up in the story of when someone in your family dies, an unpleasant feeling arises, and trying to squash that feeling and stop it from from uh, causing you so much pain. In the early 70s, uh, a man by the name of Stephen Levine started bringing death out of the closet. Up until the 70s, nobody would talk about death, even though everybody experiences death in one way or another. Their family member dies, a friend dies, something like that. And one of the things that he did was he taught people to allow the grieving process to work. That means not resisting the pain, letting your heart get torn wide open by the pain and loving it anyway. Not resisting, not pushing away, not trying to control. By seeing that you are causing yourself immeasurable suffering by thinking and pondering on the death of a dear a loved one, and then not liking the feelings that arise because of that, and then trying to control your feelings with your thoughts. And we found out yesterday that that just doesn't work very well. So, letting go of the greed for the world and wanting to hold on to all of the good stuff and push away the bad stuff. That's what he's talking about here. Now, what does it mean to be ardent and fully aware? Aware of what? what your mind is doing in the present moment, how your mind moves. Being fully aware of body, of feeling, of consciousness or mind, of mind objects. Um, mindfulness is one of the trickier words in the English language because everybody's supposed to know what it means and almost nobody can give you a real, reasonable definition of it. So I'm going to give you the definition right now. It's the observation power of watching how your mind moves in the present moment. How does this relate to your being in a meditation retreat? Your mind is very nicely on your object of meditation. There can be joy, there can be happiness, there can be tranquility. And your observation power starts to fade. It's weak. And as soon as it if that slips off the object of meditation, your mind is caught by a hindrance, one kind or another. So what do you do? You notice that your mind is not on your object of meditation. You let go of the thoughts. Relax. You let go of that tight mental fist around that hindrance and relax 
and then bring your mind back to your object of meditation. The nature of the hindrances is, once they arise, they're pretty strong. So your mind is going to go back to that. But now you start noticing how that movement works. That's true mindfulness. You notice with your strong observation power how your mind stays on the object of meditation without moving. And then you notice all of the different things that happen as your mind goes away. As you become more familiar with the process and see the little things that happen in your mind and in your body. And you become familiar with it you're able to recognize these movements more clearly and more easily. And you're able to let go of the distraction more easily. And then relax. And then gently redirect your attention back to your object of meditation. So your mind gets on your object of meditation and it stays there, but your mindfulness has been disturbed by the hindrance and the hindrance is still strong. You don't jump at the first little tiny movement of mind and say, now I got you and I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop this right now. You're putting too much energy into it and that will cause more restlessness to arise. It has to be a simple noticing. And if you don't see anything between your mind being on your object of meditation and then the distraction, if you don't see anything in between that, that's fine. Let it go, relax, come back to your object of meditation. When it goes again, notice it, let go, relax, come back to your object of meditation. As you do that more, you start noticing other little things that happen right before your mind gets fully carried away. And you'll be able to say, ah, I see it because of this tightness that arises in my body. Or my body has started to slump. Whatever you'll notice a lot of different little things that occur. And it's a natural process. As you notice more easily that your mind is carried away, you start expecting it to get carried away, actually. Because that's the nature of mind. You still know that you have attachment there. But as you start to see it more and more easily, you start to see it more and more quickly. And then you'll start to notice that your mind is very still, very calm, and then it starts to wobble as your mindfulness weakens, as your observation power diminishes for whatever reason. And then it wobbles faster and faster, and then it moves away. Now, if your mindfulness and your observation is so clear and alert that you can see your mind starting to do that, you let it go right then and relax and your mind stays on your object of meditation. And it might do that a few times. And you see it each time and you let go and relax. And then that hindrance has lost a lot of energy and it fades away. There's relief and you go deeper into your meditation because you've sharpened that observation power so much more now because your friend the hindrance came And you allow it to be there without getting caught in the story of it. As your friend goes away, your, your mindfulness 
and your observation power is much stronger and you go deeper into your meditation. That's how you progress in your meditation. Now, when you're looking at how your mind goes away from, from your, uh, your meditation and gets caught by a hindrance, and I don't care whether the hindrance is lust or hatred or sleepiness and dullness or restlessness or doubt. Whatever it is, you'll start to notice that dependent origination and the process of dependent, origina a dependent origination is occurring. So, as you see that part of the process, you see that there's con you see that there's six sense cases, mind being one of them, and contact and feeling and craving and clinging and becoming. You see that over and over again, you start to really go more deeply into your practice. You start to really understand that all of the times you've heard me mention dependent origination, this stuff is for real. It's not a concept. It's not a philosophy. This is a reality. This is how mind moves. This is how mind works. So your hindrances are absolutely a necessary part of your spiritual practice. And some people will come to me and they say things like, okay, I'll watch the hindrances, but how long do I have to do it? As long as it's there. Learn from your hindrances. There's your teacher. Where is your attachment? Caught up in that hindrance. You better believe it. Why did that hindrance arise? Who cares? Do you have to analyze things when a hindrance arises? No. That's the Western disease. This is where a lot of people teaching meditation right now are making a mistake. And there's an awful lot of people that are becoming more and more confused about what Buddhism really is and what it's teaching. Because they don't go to the suttas and see for themselves whether what is being taught is what the teacher is saying. Or is it some kind of fantasy that the teacher is working on? 